uh, we were at a position where force shaping was taking off because of the the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm. And they were starting to say that they wanted uh, more people in high needs career fields. Uh, so I threw my name in a hat. I was like, you have a high need career field. I'll take it because the last thing I want to do is end up flying a C-130 uh, for the next 10 years because I didn't even sign up to be a pilot. And there are lots of pilots out there who love being pilots. They should be the ones flying. For sure. I'm just a, I'm a seat. I'm, I am a lost opportunity to some good pilot out there. So I wanted out of that position. Uh, and that's how I ended up getting cross-trained into space and missiles, which is a 13 Sierra. And I got my top secret SCI Cat 6 and Cat 12 clearance. I learned about nuclear weapons. I went out to California for training. And that was really how I, how I rounded out and finished my military career was uh, as a nuclear missile officer. Now, as a nuclear missile officer, my first thoughts are the dude sitting in a bunker, insert the key, turn on three, you know, is that you? That was me, dude. 100%. That was me. How but, tough of a job is that, man? That's got to be so tough. It, it's hard in different ways. Like, the hardest part about the job is not necessarily sitting underground. Sitting underground sucks. It, yeah. It's miserable. The hardest part of the job is all of the education and all of the maintenance that you have to do to maintain current to control a nuclear weapon. That's every month you're taking two tests. Every month you're going through two simulators. Every month you've got at least three alerts, and each alert is between 48 and 72 hours underground. So your time becomes this constant grind of life without the sun or life in a simulator where you have sun, but you have to pretend like you're underground or you're cramming for the next big test. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the thing that makes it bearable is that you're on a, a nuclear missile base where everybody else is in the exact same situation as you. So everybody's social calendar, everybody's vacation calendar, everybody's life revolves around this grind. So it's very easy to have that community, uh, but it is most definitely a difficult grind. It seems like every few years there's news that comes out of that area that there's a bunch of like issues, you know, like guys are on drugs. This is happening. This is happening. And I'm like, man, you have these people sitting underground in bunkers, you know, all day, every day. Like, of course there's issues. I, how could you, that's like mentally, how could that be sustainable? You know what I'm saying? I can't imagine <laughs> that's gotta be so stressful, especially when you're first figuring it out, like the rhythm and, and all that stuff, just, uh, I don't want to say loneliness of it, but the like monotony of it, the, I don't know. I mean, tell us, is, it, was, is that how it was? Was it just like, Yeah, there's uh, a couple. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's, um, there is a, there's an element of loneliness there, but I think the bigger challenge, I mean, when you're underground, you're not underground alone. You're underground with one other person. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't like that other person, at least you've got someone down there, right? You got someone that's suffering with you at the same time. The bigger challenge is that, you spend so much time working hard that when you're 23 years old, 27 years old, and you're unmarried and you've got no kids and you're making, you know, an officer's paycheck, a lieutenant's paycheck at the time, whatever that is, $35,000, $37,000 a year. When you only get five days off a month, it's really hard to fight the urge not to party hard. Mm -hmm. And you're partying hard in these really remote really barren, desolate places. You're in North Dakota, you're in Wyoming, you're in the, the, the flat, uninteresting part of Montana, right? When you're in nuclear service, you're not in Chicago where you can go to a cool nightclub. Uh, and when you party hard, like you end up being around a crowd of people that's not a good crowd, they're all partying hard and all of a sudden bad decisions are made because they seem like good ideas. And it's just, it's, it's, like putting uh, putting lighter fluid on a on a match, it turns into a big flash. Most times, nobody really sees that big flash, and you just mm -hmm. end up hovering over your toilet later on in the afternoon. But uh, but sometimes when the wind is right, a forest fire kicks up, right? And you've got multiple people arrested. You know, ma major damage that's being done, and the United States Air Force has to walk back some kind of uh, embarrassing moment that its elite nuclear missile teams have made a bad decision yeah. with their own community, right? In their backyard. So, yeah, I mean, it, again, it's, it's what a crazy job. Is that, is that, 
I mean, the seriousness of the job, If when we're actually looking at it, like if you actually look at the role of the job, you're the guy that's launching the nukes if something happens. Obviously a serious job. Can you just quit? Can you be like, you know what, man, this isn't for me. Like this is not, I am not for this, or this is cracking me, sitting underground all day is cracking me. You know, is that, is that an option? So it's an option like quitting anything else in the military is an option where it, it is and it isn't. If you, uh, one of the big things that they do when you're in training in the pipeline to be a nuclear missile officer, they do a lot of check-ins and evaluations with you. Do you have the, it takes extreme structure and order and consistency and performance to, to get qualified to handle a nuclear weapon. There's all the, there's, I mean, it's a huge book of requirements that you have to demonstrate consistently to maintain the ability to, to wear a key if you have to wear a key. Uh, yeah. So there, there's that element. But then there's also the psycholo psychological element where they're always checking in to say, you know, can you handle this? Are you a conscientious objector? Do you have a problem if you're called upon to launch? You know, how would you feel if you nuked Syria? Would you, would you be remorseful or whatever else, right? So you go through all these questions and there's the, the military is always really good at finding a way to, to desensitize you just enough by turning you into a professional soldier. Cause that's what a professional soldier is. Mm -hmm. Professional soldiers are soldiers who are desensitized to the act of violence. They have to commit in the best interest of protecting the American people. That's the difference between a militia person and a professional soldier. Militias don't go through that, that systematic training. So if they ever actually have to shoot somebody, they're like traumatized by the act of shooting someone. Mm -hmm. Military soldiers, they have to go through quite a bit of active conflict before they really have to worry about significant trauma because of the way they're sensitized. So they sensitize us to a lot of that. So by the time we get underground, I mean, we've been in simulators for six or 12 hours at a time. So by the time we get underground, it's almost more of a, of a reward. We've achieved the thing that we've been training for for so mm -hmm. long. You know, you're one of America's trusted silent sentinels, uh, and we can be very proud of our service in that, in that position. Uh, but that's, that's more of how it's kind of framed up for us. And then if you start to crack, if a year or two years of this grind starts to get to you, you can, of course, go through different types of convalescent leave and psychiatric leave and everything else. But if you, if you raise your hand and you quit, you're tanking your career, you're incurring debt with the U.S. military, uh, you know, you're, you're taking a big risk like you would if you quit the SEALs or if you quit, uh, you know, as an Air Force personnel officer. When you quit, you take on significant risk. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, man, it's a, again, it's a real, it's a serious responsibility because if that ever call came and it was for real, you know, like, I don't know, man, it's hard to even... Like you could talk about launching a nuke at a country, but to actually really understand what that means and the impact of what that would have is almost unimaginable. You know what I'm saying? It's you know, what's, what's interesting, and I'll offer this up for, for you, Justin, too, is we're not aiming our nukes at intermediary countries. Mm -hmm. We're aiming them at the nastiest of the nasties. So if you needed to launch, if, you were, if the president called upon you and gave you a valid launch code, you would have zero issues turning that key. By the time you get to that position, you would have zero issues turning that key. You know exactly where your warheads are pointed. You know exactly where they're going. And the places they're aiming are so nasty that you've kind of already, you already realize that, that the damage that that country can do to us is so significant, it's worth just, you know, the uh, scorched earth approach. It's, it's very similar to what I imagine U.S. troops felt in World War II when they had to consider dropping nukes on Japan. Mm -hmm. That that not dropping the nukes was going to have so much more negative impact on American lives that if you're going to have that much damage, it might as well be on your adversary. That's exactly how it feels to sit down there and carry that weight. You're like, you know what? This is bad news, but if I have to choose between foreign deaths and American deaths, I'm wearing an American flag on my shoulder. It's not a hard decision. Humans are an interesting creature, man. You know what I'm saying? That's it's just so crazy. Nuclear war stuff just is it's mind boggling. When you were in this position, is that when you started considering applying to the CIA or was this something was that afterwards? Like what was your what was your catalyst to like wanting to transition out of the military and did you go straight into, you know, the intelligence community? Yeah, so honestly, after being